uh, you already know him. Uh, he gave a talk uh, a month ago here in the center. Uh, so this, this uh, short course that he's going to give here in the center, it's a follow-up on that talk. Uh, Andre is a specialist in valuation theory and singularities. And we're very happy to have him here in Bulgaria as a postdoc. Uh, this is um, an educational course, uh, so it's meant to be accessible to graduate students, but also to mathematicians who are not algebraic geometers. Uh, that being said, you are very welcome to ask questions. So it has to be interactive. Yeah, if you don't know something, you have questions about something, please uh, ask. <coughs> Feel free to ask Andre. Uh, maybe you have to raise your voice uh, so that the question is recorded uh, because we don't have a separate mic for the question. So yeah. Um, well, I'm going to. Uh, Leave everything else to uh, Andre, please. Thank you, Tony, and uh, thank you everyone for coming. So, uh, my course will be a general introduction to But in order to do that, I will this also also double as a very quick introduction to algebraic varieties. I need to introduce the objects, and so it could also be seen as a uh, very compact, very sped up introduction to the very basic objects of algebraic geometry. Uh, since our problem will be very uh, close to the algebraic setting. Um, so, okay. so, in order to introduce algebraic geometry, I'll introduce uh, only three problems to at least motivate a little bit the area of algebraic geometry in general. So, I'll start with a problem that uh, many people have known since high school, which are the Pythagorean. Okay, so most of you know that these are just integers such that a squared plus y squared is equal to z squared. So of course these are related to the famous Pythagorean uh, theorem. So we want to find a rectangle, uh, right angle. Uh, triangles with integer uh, lengths, of course. So we know we can proceed by doing a lot of arithmetic between uh, <coughs> these uh, quantities, but I want to propose to you a very geometric uh, solution, or at least a very uh, geometric approach to this. So first of all, let's do a little bit of uh, some reductions about this situation. So we can suppose x, y, z are prime. So how do you reach this? We, well, you just take the GCD of x, y, and z and you divide this relationship since all of it since it will appear and it will be true here, here, and here. So we just simplify by the GCD. Okay. Uh, then, these, uh, one of the things that would be interesting would be to consider uh, A for X over Z and B for Y over Z. Now, why do I do that? Simply because I will simply divide by Z squared here. I suppose we can eliminate or at least ignore The trivial solution right, it is the only solution with z equals zero. So we can eliminate the situation and then uh, our equation 
So, we have our circle and we want to find rational uh, points, that means uh, points in the circle with rational coordinates. So, a way an algebraic geometer would try to approach this problem is to find a rational parameterization of the circle. Now, what does that mean? of A and B in, in, uh, in terms of the m topos here are rational functions. For us, that means <coughs> A and B are rational functions. And just to be completely exhaustive about this notion, these are quotients of polynomial equation, polynomial expressions. Okay. So by parameterization, what does that mean? That means that every kind, every point here will be attained by someone here, by this one. An even better idea, an even better uh, requirement would be that this would be some sort of bijection. But it turns out that it is quite difficult to obtain a complete bijection. Now, however, I will show you a way to obtain this uh, for almost every point on the circle. So for this, we use the half angle trick. So I have a point here, AB, on the circle. Okay, so this is the point 
1, 0, and just a bit different looks better. What our points are, this is the point minus 1, 0. And we take a line that joins any point AB with uh, this, this point here. Okay. And we consider the length of this y-intercept, and we call it t. Right? In other words, t it's also, is also the slope of this orange line. Okay? And we can actually express the uh, coordinates at the points A and B in terms of this slope t. So t is going to be the slope of the orange line, okay? And uh, we find, I will uh, skip the computation, uh, the computational part. Uh, we can actually express A and B in terms of t. So a would be 1 minus t squared over 1 plus t squared and b is equal to 1 plus t squared. Um, <coughs> maybe uh, this raises some uh, memory of uh, trigonometry. This being uh, t is equal to the tangent of the half angle under which we can see the the point A from the point A. Uh, so, well, just from the monetary measurements. This is the end of it. Okay, so this is just a. So, we have this expression of A and B, and we can actually also express t in uh, terms of uh, a and b, I mean t is the slope of this line, and of course, as you can see, we have a here, so the slope of the line would be the height of this point uh, divided by the, uh, the spread on the x-axis. So this length here will be a plus 1, and this length here will be b. So t is also equal to B over A plus 1. So in some sense, we have established a uh, map from Q to the circle. Uh, so I'll just find it C like this. Okay, so I'm not a little bit but at least now we have a clear indication of what I meant here. So this is a uh, parametrization of C, but there is a problem. Uh, <coughs> well, uh, there is the only point that is not uh, reached is the point minus one zero. For uh, this point to be reached, we would need to have T go to infinity. But clearly this is not the case. Okay. So, and it's an exercise to show, of course, I mean, just from the, these equations, we can see that this, uh, that P of T is rational if and then if T is rational, of course. Um, but there are certain problems. The first problem is, well, as I mentioned, that minus 1, 0 is not in the image of 5. So this may be a first problem. So in order to correctify this, we would need to, in some sense, compactify uh, the set, uh, set of integers to uh, And 
deliberately uh, introducing some terms that I will explain a little bit later because I think some of the things will become too, com too complicated. Sorry. I'll explain later what we'll be talking about project experience. This object is when we talk about projective projects. Okay. Now, uh, yes. so this is an example of what we call a birational equivalence, meaning that it is a parameterization that uh, uh, verifies. Almost everything we would like on this type of parameterization to satisfy, except at a finite number of points. Right? Um, this map P is an example of what we call the direction. My first example, and uh, we will see that birational morphisms are very important in uh, resolution similarities in particular. Uh, so this concludes my first example. The, I I'd like to talk about a uh, second one. Uh, this one is very well known as well. example I wanted to talk about was the prism steering. So now we consider uh, uh, we still we are still in the plane uh, geometrically, so we still have our x and y uh, coordinates. We are going to take two two, uh, two variable polynomials. Okay. So K for me will generally mean a field, X and Y are uh, indeterminates. Two polynomials. Uh, that determine Okay. So these uh, curves I'm going to simply write them C F and C G. Okay. And <clears throat> I'm going to write a little bit. There, let's say, quick sketch of what they should look like. Uh, so, we're going to put a potential here. And I'm going to have the first curve, let's say, here, maybe a minute, something like that. <coughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and maybe something that looks like a problem. some so well, this is just to have a, an image of what. Okay, and what uh, what is the Bessemer concern with? 
uh, its uh, concern are the intersection points of these curves. We want to know how many uh, points of intersection are there between C F and C G. This is the main idea. Okay. So what I've uh, drawn on the on the left are well, one could recognize a parabola, one could recognize an ellipse. So they are both degree two curves, meaning that the polynomial they are defined by are degree two. So we would expect to have four points, two times two equal four. Okay, so we have a point of intersection here, here, here. Okay, the drawing seems rather clear. So the idea would be the following. We would expect to have degree f times degree g uh, points of intersection. Now, the degree here of these polynomials is the total degree of the polynomial, meaning that I consider um, every monomial in f and I take the one with the highest degree. This is the degree of and it will also double at the degree of our curve. Now, uh, we could expect, but this is not what uh, happens uh, at all sometimes. Uh, first of all, well, there are some, uh, uh, some problems that arise. Well, if the curves G, uh, G and F have, uh, well, for instance, if they are equal, they have an infinite amount of points. Uh, so we need to kind of uh, uh, mend that situation. So for that, we simply say that we require F and G to not have Uh, any common component. Any component in common. So another example of this, uh, what might happen to this, I'll give you a very explicit example for this, very easy one. So we are simply going to consider F would be well, f of x, y is just x, and g of x, y, x, y. So, uh, these are very simple to draw. Okay, so uh, the curve of f is just the y axis. So let's see, okay. Orange, so this is CF. And the curve of G are any point that is zero either uh, in X or in Y. So these are the union of the two coordinate axes. So this is C of G. So you can see that here we have the points of intersection is all the Y axis. So there is an infinite amount points of intersection. So this is what we call a, com a component in common. Uh, so, like 
example, if R is uh, well, if our field numbers, we can consider a very simple example. C of G, no, C of F, sorry, is going to be Y, okay, so it's just the X coordinate this time, and the second uh, uh, polynomial is going to be, let's say, Yeah, yeah, the real numbers. Yeah, yeah. R is the real numbers. This is not a counter example when the guy is not only right for uh, what happens in that case. When K is not only right, why the field is not only right? Yeah, yeah, but uh, this is a counter example. This is a, uh, a counter example to what happens. Yeah, this is there, it's not. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. Airport is uh, counter example. Yeah. Uh, oh. uh, J is equal to. Okay. Yeah. So this is at a degree D curve, this is a degree one curve, so we would like to have two points, but they are done because they play these curves do not have a second distance. Okay, so we will require require this to be algebraic. Uh, okay. Now uh, the third problem, there are many. So this was a problem, this was a, a result that took some time to be uh, formulated in its uh, final form. The third problem is that we need points and infinity. is <coughs> x squared minus 5. 
And you can actually verify that these points, these two curves meet at a single point, even if we consider the complex numbers. Okay? So, <coughs> they meet at a single point. Even in C2, but we would expect to have two points. So, what is the problem? Well, the problem is that it's a point but counted twice. This is the multiplicity. Right? Another way of seeing it is like having a dynamical interpretation of this. Generally, we have two points of intersection between the line and the, the parabola. Okay. We have two points. But if we raise the parabola, these two points will meet. Right? And they will su uh, superimpose once, uh, once the curve becomes tangent. Okay. So this is. Uh, uh, the Bezout theorem uh, serves to justify a couple of conventions that we have, at least. Uh, so from now on, I will suppose that uh, the, our base field is algebraically closed. So this is uh, something that will uh, make everything more or less easy and we'll see as well that it helps us to uh, formulate the, one of the fundamental theorems in algebraic geometry, the zero theorem of uh, And this is really the, the root situation to translate geometric properties into algebra and vice versa. So we all suppose that uh, our base field is algebraic closed. Okay, so I should give it a notation to always be a capital K. And also our rings, well, I suppose that most of you know what ring is, um, are going to be commutative. Uh, we'll try to uh, very often uh, we'll 
implicitly think of the complex numbers as our basic of k. But in order to draw some pictures, we will have to go to the real plane, uh, unfortunately. But it also serves to have uh, uh, the real picture, I don't know, the picture in the real plane, I think. Uh, also serves to uh, fix our intuition and our ideas. So I'll just uh, think of a note that this kind of occurred. Okay. So, uh, if you have taken uh, differential geometry, or at least studied uh, curves and surfaces, you would know that this point here is problematic, because this does not allow us to say that this curve is a manifold at this particular point, because it looks like an X locally, and it's a curve, so it should look like a line everywhere, which is not the case. So this is the first example of a singular. Uh, 
x will be equal to 1 plus t squared.
underlying of this concept, or was well, would be to arrive at a proof of resolution singularities, not of curves but of surfaces, at least for uh, the complex numbers. This will be uh, Zariski's original proof that involves the local uniformization. Okay, so now we're going to start with more, uh, let's say, formal part of the course, of the lecture, about uh, affine complexes. So we will accustom ourselves with some examples of equations. Let's now start with uh, the very first, uh, let's say, chapter of this uh, course will be a fine one. So I will use a couple of references. They are minimal in the sense that they are few, <laughs> but they are very accessible and they are very, uh, very well written. They are classical. So the first exam, the first uh, reference I'm going to use, and uh, abbreviate as I M, is Atia McDonald's introduction to commutative algebra. Because we want to see it as a 
separate object. It will be something that won't have the same properties as k of n. We write it differently because it is not supposed to have the same properties. Supposed to have the same structure. Well, for instance, uh, k of n is a vector space, so we can uh, multiply things by scalar, which is not the case for things that will come next, which are varieties, and we want to consider these tuples as a separate variety. And a variety will be something where we add some conditions on these tuples, meaning polynomial equations, and this is why I kind of left a small empty place here is that it is the, uh, the variety with zero conditions, in some sense. Okay, well this is called the affine space. Is the affine space. Okay. Now, as I said, if we have the uh, now, uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, uh, yeah, let's put it here. So now if we add conditions, so if I don't want to have some things inside of here, we will talk about the zero locus of the set of polynomials. So now, Now on, I will consider n variables and a set of polynomials in this. It could be infinite, it could be finite. For now, we don't really ask that question. So, uh, we simply want to know, to talk a little bit about it, the zero locus, as we already have done. Uh, we will write it via less. V is, to, is a stand-in for the variety. Right? These are the points K of n such that f of a is equal to zero for all f in x. <coughs> okay. And we call this type of uh, uh, this type of subset is an affine subset of A and F. Now, there's a little bit of a discussion about the terminology. Is that uh, sometimes we um, omit this place just to say, okay, this is just an affine variety. What we, do, we sometimes don't need to. Put specify which space it is embedded in. Uh, the second uh, thing I wanted to say is that uh, in Gatman's lectures, you will find that he calls this a variety, which is not technically, well, it's, uh, if he chooses to say it is true, but uh, a lot of people, and the way I was uh, taught, well, this was simply an affine subset, and an affine variety would be an affine subset, which is irreducible. But we'll see that once we come to irreducible uh, affine uh, uh, subspace. Okay. Uh, yeah. this, so this is the first the definition we have. This is our bread and butter.
We have the reverse inclusion and the uh, affine subset. This is relatively easy. If I have more polynomials, the set shrinks. Quite easy. Okay. Uh, now, if I have uh, two subsets, and now there's no really inclusion between the two, then I can actually build an affine subset, which is, which is the union of the two.
So the affine end space is an affine subset. example we know, we all know, is uh, linear subspaces. Okay, so linear subspaces are fine. So hyperplanes, lay, uh, uh, lines, everything we know from linear algebra, these are fine spaces. In some sense, of right geometry. Uh, and it generalizes many of the tools from linear algebra to more complicated ones. Okay, there's a one. Uh, so, if you say linear subspaces, does it mean finite dimensional? Uh, this will be finite dimensional because they are considered in AMFK. So. But linear subspaces, what does it mean? Oh, linear subspaces, given by linear equation. If I take one of my variety, and if I take a second one of my subspaces, sorry, I can take the product. Right? The, the Cartesian products, uh, the Cartesian uh, <coughs> products. So this will be included in like this in the product of uh, their fine spaces respectively. And this is also just a and n plus n. Uh, is this a, a fine variety? The answer is yes. And the only subtlety we would need to make sense of is notation. Because basically, what we need here to justify is uh, what are the equations of this uh, element. So, uh, is if x is vs and y is vt, uh, we can suppose that we take s is in vs1, xn, and t is in y1, yn, and the product. going to be V of S union T where S union T is considered inside the polynomial where we have all these variables together. Like that. with these uh, subsets S. What kind of uh, reductions we could make? Well, first of all, for S, I can say up until now, we can consider the ideal generated by S. Okay? generated by S and it turns out that we don't add any extra points if we just consider its ideal meaning that V of the ideal is equal to V of the generated well this is a this is a negative Now, the very interesting part 
is that we are working with this type of data. Right? So here, by Hilbert's basis theorem, Hilbert's This uh, ideal yeah, is finitely generated. Say by some subset uh, T Okay, so even if we start with S being an infinite uh, subset of the polynomials we can consider it's uh, uh, the idea generated by this uh, subset and by the Hilbert basis theorem we can generate it by a finite number of polynomials so here's the, the fun trick is that we, take, we go from V of S we take its uh, ideal this idea will be finitely generated and so we can just take this finite number. So any affine subset is uh, given by a finite number of equations. An ideal theory. So, uh, yeah. if I take G this time, then I can consider as its uh, fine subset, and this will also be something a little bit bigger it's radical okay so what is this time radical ideal of j so it is defined as the set Say raised to a power. Let's see. So the radical actually what it does usually or what we imagine it does it eliminates multiplicities. I'll give just an example. Let's just consider x uh, square the idea inside of k of x, and the radical of k of x square is just radical. As you can see, sometimes there are many cases where the idea is not always And we also call, we will call J a radical ideal. If it is equal to this value. And they will become very interesting once we establish uh, the, the connection between varieties and uh, and ideas. Okay. Okay. Very 
Now, if we consider uh, this extra two of ideals in our hand, uh, what happens if we go a little bit the other way? We started with a fine subset of uh, fk, and we obtained, uh, and we now want to do the opposite operation. We want to go from a fine subset and give us an ideal, or at least uh, polynomials. So, uh, and this will be a little bit of general definition. So, set X any subset. So, this is a definition that applies for any subset, not just the applying ones. Uh, it's ideal, so this is going to be ideal associated with this, is oh, uh, denoted y of x, which this time are going to be in polynomials such that f of x is equal to 0 for all x in this subset. Okay, so this is kind of a dual notion, right? V of S, we took polynomials, we had points. Uh, I of X takes points and gives us polynomials. Okay. Uh, and kind of like what we uh, happen to have with the V operation, we can have some form of similarity, similarly uh, defined properties for uh, the ideal. So if I take x1 inside of x2, then i of x1 contains i of x2. It's similarly a we say that this is a contravariant definition. Or if you want to consider the inclusion order, this is a decreasing operation. Okay, the second property, which was not is that uh, any ideal i of x or some <laughs> x with a and a k is radical. Okay? Now the main ingredient for this is very easy. If f of k of x is zero for some x in the subset, then f of x is equal to 0 to begin with. Right? So this gives you the non-trivial inclusion in this, in this, uh, this setting. Okay, and finally a couple of uh, extra information about this is that on the level, if we take an ideal and we uh, consider uh, the uh, our uh, the union and the intersection. What happens on the level of ideals instead? Well, we can uh, establish that if I have v of i of x one and I try to consider the, its union. Okay, well, we've seen that this is also equal to. Uh, v of i of x1 times i of x2 but this uh, it also is equal to the intersection and this was not established for uh, for arbitrary subsets sometimes um, 
So consider, uh, if you consider two, uh, one affine subset, you can actually have two sets of degenerators of the same affine subset, which are disjoint. And they, so, so we wouldn't have pockets in that, in that set. Okay. So. At least I will manage to formulate the fundamental result that will link uh, affine subsets and ideals, which is the Nullstrom set. And this is really the very first, very big theorem of uh, algebraic geometry. This is to that. So, see, it's kind of a big word. So basically, this uh, this means the theorem of zeros of quadrants. Ah. So uh, it has several parts, but at least we can digest it in several parts. First of all, what happens if I take uh, uh, let's say a defined subset or yeah, a defined subset is it going to be a defined this time? Uh, what if I take its ideal? Well, this will give me back x. So this is a theorem, it's not uh, But what happens on the other side, the algebra side? So I take j an ideal. Expect that at least the radical should be inside of this place. This is a radical idea, it contains J naturally, and it should at least contain the radical idea. Well, the very interesting part here is that there's nothing else. This is the new, this is the new, uh, interesting part of the notion of that is that this is equal to the radical. So the only Let's say um, uh, non trivial part, or at least the only uh, yeah. is the inclusion from left to right. You assume that. Yeah. Algebraic flows, yeah, yeah. This is the convention I assumed uh, at, the very very, at the very beginning. We are always and still in the algebraic flows. And in fact, the notion of that does not work. And in fact, yeah, yeah. Uh, if the field is not uh, uh, algebraic flows, the inclusion. This is the really difficult part, and uh, this uh, has several um, equivalent statement, statements uh, of links between these different statements. Um, so, I, uh, one place you can uh, start looking about is Alfie Right. So, 
the very the first time you can they give a uh, clear that is proposition seven nine. But given in this form, they do it in a very guided exercise exercise property. I need the both in order to have this exact statement. Okay. Okay. So I'll just so uh, and I'll finally finish by giving the, the final statement that this gives a correspondence. One to one correspondence Okay, so I'll draw a bigger picture because we still have a, a bit of room but As you can imagine, on one side we'll have a fine subset Subsets of A and K, and on the other hand, we will have deals of so this is going to be a one on one correspondence. If I take an affine subset, I just Ideal, and if I have an ideal here, I just take its zero roots. Like this. And, if, and uh, the one and two statement basically means that these are self, uh, they, they are the um, uh, bijections and they are inverse to each other, these applications. So this is the first real link between the geometry and the algebra. And very often what we will have, what we will want to do is to look at the geometry from an algebraic perspective and to look at some algebraic norms of these ideals and try to give it a geometric shape something. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, if I go to, if I want to continue, I'll take too much time. So I'll end my discussion here and I hope that this gave you a little bit of a, of a feel for what, uh, what these uh, problems will be in the future. Okay, thank you. Okay.